All right. Shalom. Welcome to tonight's class. We got some coming in right at, right at the bell. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. And hopefully we'll have some more come in um, as we progress tonight. And here we go. Welcome, everybody. Give me just a moment. We've got some coming in. All right. Welcome. All right. To tonight's class. You guys, if you didn't know, I'm still um, dealing with some legal things in Hawaii. So um, that's almost wrapped up. My, my stuff is almost done. And then I'll be going back to Miami this week, hopefully before the election. I'd like to get home before the election. And uh, we will. Things will be a little different for me. It's been kind of chaotic since I've been here. You guys, I've had to focus on other things. And, um, you know, not so much on, on codes like I like to, or this class, um, it's been a lot of legal stuff. I got to meet with my lawyer Tuesday and then I can fly out of here and then, uh, we can get back to normal as far as, um, the time, I know it's eight o'clock where you, the East coast, it's two o'clock where I am here. So I'm. You know, this time difference thing is a little crazy for me. So, you know, uh, every day that I wake up, I'm like several hours behind everybody on the mainland. So it, it's a lot of catching up and reading comments and emails and messages and things like that. It takes me a couple hours a day to just get through that. Anyway, no complaints. Um, welcome, everybody. I do think uh, Paul's going to be joining us. He was um, somewhere three hours from his house and um he, he had some codes he wanted. So that was going to be at the end of the class. So we're going to finish up tonight the Hebrew Yeshua and um, and the Greek Jesus teaching from um, Nehemiah Gordon. And then we're going to progress right into some codes. I, I've got a few that I can talk about. If there's any of you that are working on anything you want to share, we'll, we'll share those. But Paul's also got some that he is really eager to, to share about um, the SDA. And um, he's been working on it a while. Anyway, let me open up with prayer. Then we're going to finish with um, Nehemiah. We're going to pick up, you know, it's less than than uh, what we've already seen already. It's a two-hour video. We've already been through more than an hour of it. We're going to pick up at the the uh, the Hebrew Matthew and then progress from there. And then at the end, we're gonna we're gonna talk about a few codes. All right, you guys. So let me open up with prayer. I'll be who I'm so thankful, Father, for this time once again to gather in your name. And to share your word, Father, and we just join. We ask that you join us in this meeting today, that you would lead us in the way that we should go, Father, but also keep us protected from the enemy. We ask this in Yeshua's name, Amen. And uh, people are still coming in. Very good. Good to see you. And uh, I don't know what's going on. Where there's something going on, I don't know about. I know the World Series playing right now, but I don't think my students are into that right now. <laughs> so, anyway, let me uh, let me just go ahead and get this started so we can get through it and be done with it. And uh, we will progress right into some, well, what I have is election codes. And what Paul's working on is uh, SDA stuff. And I think Margie may be working on something. But let's, let's just go back to Nehemiah here and get this wrapped up. So starting from the uh, when he was talking about Shem Tov um, and the Hebrew Matthew, and, and during this time, during Shem Tov's lifetime, he was trying to pr prove to the Catholic Church that Yeshua actually kept the Torah. And what the Catholic Church was doing was actually not, um, you know, exactly what Yeshua was doing. So um, th that's very important. Uh, and noteworthy in history that this actually happened in the 1400s when this this rabbi came against well there was this conflict between the catholic church at that time and so he used the hebrew matthew to point out that yeshua was actually keeping torah he was keeping shabbat he was keeping the feast and uh, we were supposed to be doing the same thing and what the catholic church was doing doesn't exactly line up to what yeshua was teaching and that was the absurdity of it and and the fact that many Christians don't know this kind of blows my mind. They never had the you know time to go back and, and study church history and how things came about and 
you know, all these stories. So let's let's pick up where he, where he's talking here about um, the Hebrew Matthew. And because of that, the present publication, uh, based on the nine manuscripts, is really an incomplete picture of what's contained within this document because it wasn't based on all of the manuscript evidence. And this is really a fascinating manuscript because this is the first time this manuscript is being seen in the Western world. The first time this manuscript is being shown here. This is an unpublished manuscript, and who knows what's contained in these pages. Now, when I went to look at this manuscript in Jerusalem, actually this is uh, in St. Petersburg in the former Soviet Union in the city that was previously known as Leningrad. And with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, a delegation of Israeli scholars went over to St. Petersburg and they began to microfilm all the Hebrew manuscripts they could get their hands on, literally to photograph every single page. And when I went to St. Petersburg, or I went to, when I went to look at the St. Petersburg manuscript in Jerusalem, I took it out, and when I brought it back to the librarian at Israel's National Library, he said to me a very interesting thing. He said, Nehemiah, was there anything interesting in that manuscript? And I thought that was a very strange question. I'd looked at many manuscripts. I've never had the librarian ask me if there's anything interesting there. That's just not his job. And I said, why are you asking me that question? And he said, because no one has ever checked out that manuscript to look at it before. This has been sitting in Israel for the last more than 10 years, and no one had looked at this manuscript, no one had studied it, quite simply because there are thousands of these Hebrew manuscripts that have been uncovered from the so former Soviet Union, and it will take generations and generations of Hebrew scholars to uh, study all these manuscripts and decipher them, and no one's gotten around to this one. It's simply, you can imagine that, Hebrew manuscripts of New Testament books are not very high on the agenda of some Israeli scholars. Uh, so who knows what's contained within the pages of this manuscript? No one knows. Well, I know, but really no one knows because no one studied it. And what uh, revelations of truth are waiting to be revealed by studying this document? Here's another unpublished manuscript, which is the Breslau or Breslau manuscript. This is also originated in a city in Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union. However, today this manuscript is not in Breslau. It's actually in Prague. And there's a very interesting story behind this unpublished, unpublished manuscript as well. In the 1940s, the Nazis ransacked Europe looking for Jewish artifacts, uh, Judaica articles of artwork and manuscript and Torah scrolls, anything they could get their hands on. And they brought them all to Prague and they set them up in a museum which the Nazis called the Museum of the Extinct Race. Because the goals of the Nazis was to make the Jews extinct. And actually, to this very day, that's the largest collection of Judaica in the world, this former museum of the extinct race. And uh, who's extinct today and who isn't? That's a testimony, I think. Uh, we're still here. Uh, this, is a, this is another manuscript. This manuscript actually is published. This is from the British Library. And the answer to our question of Matthew 23 can actually be found in this manuscript in the bottom five lines there, which is the section from Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. And when we read that in the Hebrew, we'll get a completely new understanding. Everything we'll, that we're seeing now, these contradictions, Matthew 15, don't obey the Pharisees. Matthew 23, do obey the Pharisees. Right now, we're struggling with this contradiction. When we read it in the Hebrew, everything will fall into place and we'll have a much clearer understanding Everything will make sense. Now, I want to give you some advice because I know this is a very long session, but this is stuff that uh, you, you won't learn anywhere else, and this is, this is really foundational stuff. What we're presenting here today is the tip of the iceberg. You don't even know the iceberg exists yet. We're just establishing the foundation to... Really, these are foundational things. And uh, here's the book that I wrote on this. It's called The Hebrew Yeshua Versus the Greek Jesus. And as you may have guessed, the reason I've called it that is that uh, the way Yeshua's words are presented in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew is fundamentally different from the way they're portrayed in the Greek uh, version. And that's why I call it The Hebrew Yeshua Versus the Greek Jesus. And I, I highly recommend this book because this is really foundational stuff. And there's a lot more that I wasn't even, I'm not even going to be able to present here today. So really I recommend you get this book and read it a few times. Give it to your friends and to your rabbis and your pastors. So they can also share on, especially your rabbis and pastors, so they can share on this uh, very important topic, which really I lay some of the really foundations, which in future years uh, you'll see that amazing things are going to be revealed from this, this Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. Now let me, uh, get, again, give you a piece of advice, because this is a very long study, and I've just completed the first half of the study. Michael's going to come up and say some very important words, so don't run away yet. But when Michael's done, we're going to have a short break, and then I'm going to come back and do the second half. Now the second half is really... The, really, we're getting into the, deep into this Hebrew Matthew, and it's really 
in a way, the most important part. So my advice is, if you can only come to one half of the study, come to the second half. So in Matthew chapter 23, we've seen that Yeshua says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They have this Mosaic authority. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. And here it really sounds that you, like Yeshua is saying very clearly, you must obey the Pharisees. They sit in the seat of Moses. You must obey whatever they command you to do if you're going to be obedient to what Yeshua says. Uh, well, we've already seen this doesn't really make sense. Matthew 15, Yeshua warns his disciples not to do according to the ways of the Pharisees. Their traditions of the elders transgress the Torah. However, in tw Matthew 23, he's saying obey whatever they tell you to do. If they tell you to put your uh, right shoe on first in the morning, you better obey them because they have Mosaic authority. What's going on here? Well, the answer is here in the Hebrew. And if you can read this uh, old Hebrew script, and you, can already, you already know the answer. This is what it looks like transcribed into modern Hebrew print. And what Yeshua says there in Hebrew Matthew, chapter 23, verses 2 to 3, Yeshua says, Al kisei Moshe Yeshua pirushim v'chachamim, v'ata kol asher yomar lachem shimru v'asu, u'v'takanotehem u'maasehem al ta'asu, shehem umbrim v'hem enam musim. So there you have it, there you see, it's very clear. Re uh, this is what it would look like translated into English. There Yeshua says, the Pharisees and sages sit upon the seat of Moses, therefore all that he says to you, diligently do. But according to their reforms and their precedents, do not do, because they talk, but they do not do. Now that's a very uh, subtle difference between what you saw in the Greek, a difference of one single word, or primarily one single word. In the Greek, Yeshua, or in the Greek it had said in Matthew, all that they say, you must obey all that they say, they being the Pharisees. In the Hebrew, he says, you must obey all that he says, he being Moses. So the difference of this one single word fundamentally changes Yeshua's message. What he's saying now is, obey, if their claim to authority is that they sit in the seat of Moses, so do as Moses says, obey Moses. They claim their authority as they're sitting in this, this ornate stone chair in the synagogue, sitting, they're teaching with supposed authority, sitting in the seat of Moses, so obey, obey Moses, do what Moses says. Now how did this happen? How do we change from they say to he says? Well, this is what it looks like in Hebrew, in the Hebrew manuscripts. You guys understand the importance of what he just pointed out here? Because this has been a big contentious thing for a long time, right? Because it, it, made, it made Yeshua look like he was contradicting himself, and that never happens. And the same applies with Paul. Paul's never contradicting himself, even though he says the law is bad in one place and the law is good in another place. What we don't understand is his distinct, the, the, the people he's speaking to understand the context. Does that make sense? We, as people coming more than 2,000 years later, are trying to understand the context and we're seeing this confusion and makes it look like that there's bipolarism going on, right? Does everybody follow what, what's going on? Okay, so... What he is saying here is in Matthew 23, 3, where it seems like Yeshua is telling them to obey the Pharisees, he's actually talking about Moses, because that's who sits, you know, the, the, when he's referring to the Moses, he, we're talking about the Torah, not what's been adding on, what's been added on, which, which is called the Talmud, right, or the oral uh, traditions, right? These things were stacked on men. This is the washing of hands. You know, even to ridiculous things about putting on your shoes, to turning on lights, to driving and things like that. The things that all, that's not even in the Torah, but they added on. That is what Yeshua was coming against all through the New Testament, you guys. He was not coming against the Torah. And so this is where we get the deception from Christian teaching that he was nailed to the cross. He was doing away with the Torah. And, that, and we don't even see that in his own life. He followed the, the Torah. He kept the feast. He was he was the feast. He was the fulfillment of them, right? So uh, it makes sense. And you can see it's very similar. It's almost identical. The difference between he says and they say is the difference of one single letter, the Hebrew letter Vav. This one single letter, the change of this one, the addition of this one single letter changed Yeshua's original message which was an instruction to his disciples to obey Moses, to an instruction to his disciples to obey the Pharisees. So it changed his uh, message from something that made perfect sense, their claim to authorities that they sit in the seat of Moses, so do what Moses says, to this 
message which contradicts his own words in Matthew 15, which is obey the Pharisees. By the way, you guys, he goes on warning. there, Yeshua. And we have a warning in the, uh, one of the prophets uh, talking about the lying pen of the scribe, right? Whether it's intentional or it was an accident or anything like that, the, this, the punishment for it was very severe. So someone who did that intentionally and intentionally changed, and I think we see that, um, and, and by the way, the scholars' consensus about Jubilees is this: that's what's happened to Jubilees. There's, there's two different writers and authors in Jubilees, and they contradict one another. And it was intentional. Someone came after the first writer and intentionally contradicted and, and added things to the first writer. So that you got this 29 places in Jubilees where you've got this contention. And that is contradiction. See the difference? Someone intentionally did that, and there's a contradiction. And then somewhere like in Matthew, you probably had a scribe who accidentally put that extra letter there, and it changed. You see what I'm saying? In, in Hebrew Matthew, and he says, according to their reforms and their precedents, do not do. And the word I've translated here as reforms in Hebrew is takanot. We've heard that word before, so let's all repeat that word. Takanot. So takanot are these man-made laws like the washing of the hands and Yeshua's warning his disciples not to do according to their takanot. And I translated this for as, before as enactments. A more precise dictionary definition of takanot is reforms that change biblical law. That's how the word is defined more Let's precisely even even more in the clear. Jester dictionary. Let's be even more clear. This is the Talmud. Okay, and the Talmud has many, many volumes. It, 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 it's a, a larger document than the, than the Torah is today. And so this is why they say it's impossible to keep a law, right? They're talking about the Talmud. They're not talking, by the way, the 613 laws that Jews say you have to keep, that's Talmudism, you guys. If you only go by what Paul taught or, or what Nehemiah understands, or what Yeshua taught, it's the Torah. And for any given person, we're talking maybe 50, depending on, or if, you know, if you're, if you're a, a teacher or uh, whatever, there, there might be more that you have to abide by. But, you know, not everyone has this, the same things they have to abide by. The, the women have different, you know, Things they have to abide by according to Torah. And I'm not going to get into that, right? You, you guys understand there's, there's a difference, right? So this notion and this thing that you hear people parrot, oh, you think you can be under the law, the 613? That's Talmudism. That's what the Jews teach. That's not where Yeshua stood, right? Matter of fact, keeping the Torah is actually very simple. If you're a good person, who cannot keep the Ten Commandments? Right. Love your mother and father. Don't steal from anybody. Don't, you know, commit adultery. Who has a problem with that? I mean, you should be able to go through your life normally and just let just go right through those those commandments and do just fine. Right. But we get this teaching from especially the NAR movement and stuff is everything's under grace. It doesn't matter. You can go and do this and it doesn't matter if you sin and you're once saved, always saved. All these deceptions start coming in where you don't have to keep the commandments at all. You're not under law. You're under grace. And so if you slept with your neighbor's wife, just repent. You're all good, right? <laughs> That's not exactly how it works. We're not supposed to trample on grace. There is grace, you guys. There is, you know, protection under ignorance. But that's where grace comes in. Not that you know you're breaking the law and you all you got to do, and Catholics do this. They know they're breaking the law. All they got to do is go repent to the priest and da 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 It's all done. No, you can't do that. That's called iniquity when you willfully break the law. And you know you're breaking the law and you bring yourself under that, right? So a lot of misunderstanding of what Yah's word is teaching us, folks. And that's why I think it's very important that we understand the other side of the stick. And what I mean by that is the two sticks that come together in the end times. There, there's two sides of it. And we, unless we understand both sides, we will not figure out the puzzle.
Dictionary, which is a standard dictionary of early rabbinical Hebrew, late Second Temple Hebrew, reforms that change biblical law. And the classic example of one of these man-made laws, these takanot, is the commandment to wash your hands of the rabbis before you eat bread. Well, now that we understand Matthew 23, and we see that Yeshua is not telling you to obey the Pharisees, he's telling you to obey Moses, we still have to go back at Matthew 15 and see what it says there in the Hebrew. If we started off with what, which, what was a contradiction in the Greek, we can't just look at the Hebrew of one passage and not the other. So now let's look at Matthew 15 in the Hebrew, and there we read, why do, you, why do you also, Yeshua says to the Pharisees, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? You made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Can anyone guess what the Hebrew word behind tradition is? The word is takanot. So not only is there no contradiction in the Hebrew between Matthew 15 and Matthew 23, but in the Hebrew there's a consistent message throughout the entire book. There's this consistent string that runs through the book that Yeshua is warning his disciples not to follow the takanot of the Pharisees, these man-made laws of the Pharisees. You guys, by now, you should be able to understand when you're reading your, your New Testament, you see in Yeshua coming in against the high priests and the Pharisees, who these men were, right? We're not nailing stuff to the cross just because of that. Yeshua is not coming against the Torah. He's come against the oral Torah. And the Jews do not distinguish the two. When they say, when they say law, they mean oral law and Torah. And, and when you see it, you know, in English, law and law, you, you don't have the wisdom to understand that they're, they're, they're talking about two different things. Paul is not bipolar. He is not contradicting Yeshua, and Yeshua doesn't contradict himself. Bottom line. And I submit, if that's what we come away from, from the, reading the New Testament, we've missed it. Yeshua is not bipolar. He's not talking to different groups. He's talking to everybody, okay, because the Gentiles are grafted in it. You're, you're not no longer called a Gentile if you follow Yeshua. You are now called Israel, folks, and there's no such thing as a church. Bottom line, bottom line. Matter of fact, you don't want to be associated with that word when Yeshua comes back. I guarantee you if he went to any one of them and he walked in the door today, none of them would recognize Yeshua, not one. Think about that. And that's what this teaching is about. The, the difference between a Greek Jesus and the real Yeshua. They would never recognize him. That's sad, folks. And that's why Yah, one of the reasons why Yah is, is doing threshing to this nation, right? Not just this nation, other nations. Same thing's going on in Australia, New Zealand, Europe. I just focus on this nation, and, and I probably shouldn't do that because I have people message me and, um, you know, ask me questions referring to that. So I get where the, there's a confusion there. But y'all's judging this whole world, folks. This whole world. We need to understand who Yeshua is and not um, cling to the traditions of men. And, and that applies even to Christian church, not just to Jewish tradition. We get a lot of tradition from any denomination, folks. Any one of them. We have to let it go and get back to the original, who he was, who he is. And he, who he, we're in him, okay? If we go on in Matthew 15 in the Hebrew, we read in verse 9. Remember how in the Greek it said, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? And I mentioned that that was a paraphrase of Isaiah 29, 13, which says, learn commandments of men. Others translate this, learn commandments of men, learn by rote. In the Hebrew Matthew, there's the exact quote from Isaiah word for word. Learn commandments of men. Now that's very interesting. If Hebrew Matthew is supposedly this translation from Greek, wouldn't it have the... You guys know why Isaiah was even speaking about this? Because when they're going into, into captivity, they had already started, they'd lost the Torah, right? They, they didn't get to go into captivity with Torah scrolls and stuff, folks, right? They didn't get to carry that kind of stuff. So they, they had what was in their heart, and from that, the Torah was, a, was lost until they come back into the land and they started making it up as they went. Okay? The commandments of men that started in Babylon. Jeremiah and Isaiah spoke about the captivity that was coming to, to, to Judah and to the northern tribes, what was going to happen to them. Ezekiel did as well. So in Matthew, 
they're referring to what Isaiah had said, or actually Yeshua is in, in this case, right? The Hebrew equivalent of teaching for doctrine the commandments of men rather than the exact precise words of Isaiah. That's a very, very interesting. Uh, Yeshua goes on, he refor- warns against the Takanot of the Pharisees. He also warns against their precedents, not to do their precedents. And the word, Hebrew word for precedents is ma'asim. Ma'asim is a word we'll look at in a moment. But these are two really important words, takanot and ma'asim, because these are the two things that if you're disciples of Yeshua, that he's warning you not to do, the takanot and ma'asim. So let's all say those words together. Takanot and ma'asim. All right, so what are these ma'asim? Ma'asim are precedents. The literal meaning is actions or deeds. And the Greek it translates this as ergon, which in your English you have works, the works of the Pharisees. But what are the works or the of the actions or deeds of the Pharisees. In Pharisee terminology, Maasim refers to precedence or acts or deeds that serve as precedence. Now, Maasim is a really interesting word because this is something that comes from, uh, all right, whoever that is, mute your, your, um, mute your microphone, whoever that was. All right, Maasim is precedence, but something you see in the Bible is called pakud or pakudi, my precepts or my concepts. We see this in, in Psalm 119 over and over again, over and over. The very, the very chapter of the Bible that splits the whole book, and it's the very center of the it, it talks about precepts over and over again, right? Pakudi, my precepts. So these precedents comes from the Pharisees, right? It's a different word. Actions. And what and- what do they mean by that? Well, we've already seen that Pharisee law needs to legislate every aspect of life, uh, literally from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to sleep at night. And what is a, uh, for example, the Pharisees t- uh, command their disciples which shoe to put on first in the morning. So what does a Pharisee do when he comes to a new situation where he, where uh, the oral law doesn't tell him what to do? For example, if he lives in a country where the, you don't have shoelaces. And he doesn't know which shoe to put on first in the morning because he doesn't know which one to tie first because there are no laces. So what he does is he combs the oral law looking for instruction and he combs tradition and uh, man-made laws. And if he can't find any instruction on which shoe to put on first in the morning if there are no laces, then he goes and he looks at the precedence of one of his rabbis. Meaning he looks and he says, we know that such and such a rabbi on such and such an occasion put on his right shoe first even though he didn't have laces. And that becomes a precedent. That then establishes what the proper norm, the proper standard of behavior is. The assumption is this rabbi could not be sinning. And if he put on his right shoe first, even though he didn't have laces, that's the proper standard for behavior. And what Yeshua is saying is, don't look to the precedents of the Pharisees as the proper standard of behavior. Don't do according to their precedents. Do as Moses says, not according to their takanot and their ma'asim. Let's look quickly at 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 an example of a precedent. This is a precedent brought in the Talmud, and it says a ma'aseh. Ma'aseh is singular for ma'asim, so a precedent. A precedent which Rabban Gamliel, you probably thought it was pronounced Gamaliel. Uh, the correct pre- Hebrew pronunciation is Gamliel. And Gamliel, as you all know, is, was the, the Pharisaical teacher of Shaul of Tarsus, of Paul. However, this is Gamliel's grandson, Gamliel II. So a precedent which Rabban Gamliel II and the elders were traveling in a ship when a Gentile made a ramp on which to descend, and Rabbi Gamliel and the elders descended by it. Okay, so what on earth is this talking about? The Pharisees start off with the principle that if somebody builds something for you on the Sabbath, you may not use that. If they build a ramp for you on the Sabbath, you may not use that ramp. And so then they ask the question, what if the ramp is built on the Sabbath, but it's not specifically for me? May I use that ramp? And the oral law doesn't tell them what to do. So they go and they say, okay, we remember that one time Rabbi Gamliel II descended on such a ramp, and that tells us that this was the proper behavior, and that such a thing is permissible. In other words, the behavior of the rabbi in a specific circumstance becomes the standard by which uh, one should behave by in the future. And what Yeshua is warning his disciples is, don't do according to their takanot, and don't do according to their ma'asim. Their claim to authority is that they sit in the seat of Moses, so do as he says. Do as Moses says. Now, what we've seen up until now is that the words of Yeshua in the Greek, what we may venture to call uh, the Greek Jesus, because that's what he's called in Greek, Jesus, Jesus. The Greek Jesus, 
He's coming and he's changing Torah, adding to Torah, taking away. He's saying, oh, don't worry about not adding to the Torah. Do whatever the Pharisees tell you to do. If they tell you what shoe to put on first in the morning, put on that, put on that right shoe first. Even though that contradicts what he said eight chapters earlier in Matthew 15. Now, we've seen now, on the other hand, the Hebrew Yeshua is actually telling people, do as Moses says. Their claim to authority is they sit in the seat of Moses. Do as he says. Do as Moses says. So the Hebrew Yeshua is actually, or Yeshua's words, as he's portrayed in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, is actually upholding Torah. Now, what about this statement, because they talk but they do not do? When I first read this, my question was, what do they talk and what don't they do? When we read this in the Greek, it's very clear that it's saying they're hypocrites. But now in the Hebrew, we have a whole new context. He's uh, not saying to obey the Pharisees, even though they don't do what they do themselves, what they say themselves. He's saying obey Moses. So what's this they talk and they do not do? What are they talking and what aren't they doing? And when I first read this, I really wasn't sure what the answer was. I wasn't so clear. And the answer came to me in a very roundabout way. Um, <clears throat> I'd received an email a number of years back from someone who was confusing Karaites and Samaritans. I mentioned to you that Karaites are strictly Old Testament Tanakh Jews. Samaritans, of course, you know from the New Testament, are the people the, in Samaria who worship on Mount Gerizim. Let's get a quick rundown of the difference. Karaites, of course, believe in the entire Tanakh, the Old Testament, whereas Samaritans believe only in the five books of Moses, the Torah. And their Torah is actually different than the Torah used by all the other Jews. In the Torah of the Samaritans, it commands them to worship on the high place on Mount Krizim, which is a mountain just outside of Nablus, of Shechem. And whereas the Karaites worship at Jerusalem and turn to Jerusalem in prayer, like King Solomon talks about in 1 Kings 8. Uh, of course, Karaites are Israelites or Jews, whereas Samaritans are Babylonians who were forcibly settled in the land of Israel by the Assyrian kings after the ten northern tribes were exiled from Israel. And the story of the Samaritans is really given in 2 Kings chapter 17, where it talks about how the ten tribes were exiled from Israel and the king of Assyria didn't want this to be an empty land so he brought in these people from Kuthia, from Babylon and settled them into the land of Israel, into the northern part of Israel. And it talks about how when they first settled in the land they were attacked by a plague of lions and they said, why are we being attacked by lions? It must be because we're not worshipping the local god. So they went to the king of Assyria and said, can you please give us a priest that will teach us how to worship the local god who of course in this case is the god of Israel. So who does the king of Assyria send them? He sends them one of the priests from the ten northern tribes. This is one of the priests that had gotten the ten northern tribes exiled in the first place. And what he teaches them is the ways of the ten northern tribes that had gotten them exiled. And he brings with him the Torah, but he also at the same time teaches them to uh, do according to the ways of these ten tribes, worshipping at the high places, sacrificing outside of the temple in Jerusalem, on Mount Gerizim and other places. And then in 2 Kings 17, verse 34, it summarizes the ways of the Samaritans, and it says, Until this very day they do according to their former ways, according to their statutes and their judgments. This is how it reads in the Hebrew. They do not fear Jehovah, and they do not do. And then in the Hebrew, the words they do not do is isolated in such a way that it emphasizes those words. And then it completes the sentence and says, According to the Torah and commandments that Jehovah commanded the children of Jacob. So what don't the Samaritans do? They don't do according to the Torah. Now after I read Matthew 23 and then I reread this passage, I realized in Hebrew this sounds very similar. There's a similar style here. And it seemed to me that Yeshua was echoing the words of 2 Kings 17.34 about the Samaritans. And I think what he was saying is that just as the Samaritans of old do according to their statutes and their judgments, and they do not do according to the Torah, so too the Pharisees of his own era do according to their takanot and their ma'asim, their reforms and their precedents, and they talk Torah, but they don't do Torah. And what does he mean they talk Torah? They're sitting in the seat of Moses, talking Torah to you all day long, but what they're really telling you is not Torah. It's just in the guise of Torah. What they're really telling you are their own reforms and precedents, and they don't really do Torah. So again, what we've seen up till now is that in the Greek, we have this... Uh, Jesus is coming along and changing Torah, saying obey the Pharisees, whereas in the Hebrew he's actually upholding Torah. Now, in light of that, how do we explain this passage, Matthew 5? Matthew 5, six times Yeshua says, in the Greek, he says, you have heard it said, but I say. 
And it really sounds when you read, it really sounds like when you read this in English, that Yeshua, or in the Greek, Jesus is coming along and changing entire Torah commandments, adding, taking away, modifying. So what's going on? Did he uphold Torah or did he not uphold Torah? And this is, this is especially a, a very difficult textual question because in that very same passage, in verse 17, he says he's not come to do away with one jot or one tittle. So how can he then turn around and a few verses later start changing things, saying, you have heard it said, but I say. Well, let's look at one passage here, one passage that particularly caught my eye. This is Matthew 5, 33 to 37. It says there in the Greek, Again you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oath you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all. And here, very explicitly, Jesus is saying in the Greek not to swear at all. It's an absolute prohibition if you're a disciple of Jesus to swear, to make any kind of oath. And in fact, you can go to any court in the United States where there's the practice of putting your hand on the Bible and saying, I swear I'll tell the truth, the whole truth, not about the truth, about me, God. And you can tell them I'm a devout Christian, a disciple of Jesus of Nazareth, and, I may, and because of that I can't swear because Matthew 5, 34 tells me I may not swear, and they won't think you're trying to pull a fast one, and they'll tell you, in fact, there's a standard formula for someone who's a devout Christian who's allowed to say, I affirm to tell the truth. And no one's going to think you're trying to pull a fast one or lie, because it's a standard thing that many devout Christians actually do. They won't swear because Jesus says, do not swear at all. He goes on, either by heaven for it is God's throne, or by the earth for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem for it is the city of the great king, and do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one here white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Who, who's, who's the evil one? Okay, we'll use that as a working definition. You're defining him as Satan. We won't get into that whole question, though. So Satan, if you say anything beyond yes or no, then you are from Satan, according to the NIV translation of Matthew 5. And what it, that means is if you say, I swear by Jerusalem... Yes, I will do such and such. You are from the evil one. And if you say, I swear by heaven, I no, I will not do that. You are from the evil one. Well, I had a real problem when I saw this because I said, okay, that, that doesn't really sound something wrong with this. And the reason I had a problem with this for me really began in, Matthew, in uh, Exodus 3.15. And many years ago, I was studying in Jerusalem under a Karite sage named Mordechai Alfandari. And he was a very brilliant man. He would never try to convince you of anything. He would just present you the scriptural verses and you, you would see that he was always right. And one day he sat me down and he said, Nehemiah, read to me Exodus 3.15 out loud. <clears throat> and I, you know, I said, okay, I'll read it to you out loud. Now bear in mind, being raised as a Pharisee, there were certain things that had been so ingrained and so uh, I'd been taught and I, I just couldn't break free from them for many years, even after I became a Karite, because, you know, these things had been ingrained so deeply. And you tell me, after I'm done reading this, what pharisaical practice I've, uh, I'm, I'm uh, expressing here. And back then I'd read this verse to Mordechai, following my pharisaical uh, indoctrination. And God said further to Moses, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, Adonai, Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial from generation to generation. So what did I, did I say anything wrong there? I said Adonai instead of what it actually says there. And in fact, it says there in the Hebrew, yud heh vav heh, which I pronounce as Yehovah, others pronounce as Yahweh or Yahweh, and I won't go now into the reasons for those differences. Uh, but it's very clear that the letters in Hebrew are yud heh vav heh, Yehovah or Yahweh, and I had read it following the rabbinical ban on the name as Adonai, which is Lord, and in fact in all of your English Bibles, or most of your English Bibles, you'll have capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which is... a uh, following this rabbinical ban in the name. In fact, in the Hebrew text of Scripture, the name of the Creator, Yehovah, appears 6,828 times. Nearly 7,000 times. That's an average of approximately seven times on each page of the Hebrew text of Scripture. And in every single instance virtually that you read in your English Bibles, you'll see it's trans translated, translated as Lord, capital L-O-R-D, in small caps which is simply the translation of Adonai. And this comes from a rabbinical ban on the name. In the Mishnah, it explains that anybody who reads that name according to its letters and not as Adonai has no portion in the world to come. So there's an absolute ban on you pronouncing the name of the Creator that the Pharisees teach. In fact, 
most Pharisees today refer to the name of the Creator as the ineffable name of God. Ineffable means unpronounceable. You may not pronounce this name. I was taught with my mother's milk that the greatest sin that I could possibly do was to say the name of the Creator. That was utter blasphemy to say His name out loud. And I was taught to say Adonai. And even after I went to the Scriptures and became a Karaite, turning just to the Hebrew Scriptures, this was something that was so deeply ingrained that when I read this verse, uh, I ended up reading it, Lord, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial from generation to generation. Even though right there in front of me were the Hebrew letters, yod heh vav heh Yehovah. Now, when I realized this, the words of the prophet came to mind, they have eyes, but they do not see. And I was talking about myself. The letters were right there in front of me, but being so indoctrinated, and this being so deeply ingrained, this band in the name, I'd read it as uh, Lord. Now, what about the end of this verse, Exodus 3.15? It goes on, it says, This is my memorial from generation to generation. Yehovah is his memorial. What, what does that mean, memorial? Today only dead people have memorials. So what's his memorial? That's just a horrible translation. The word that they translate as memorial, the Hebrew word is zecher. Now zecher in Hebrew does mean to remember, but it has a much broader meaning than it does in English. Zecher in Hebrew is to refer to something explicitly, to refer to something, you can refer to it with your mind, and that's to remember it. Or you can refer to it with your mouth, and that's to mention it. To explicitly to summon it up in your memory, or to summon it up with your mouth. Now, Exodus 23, 13 is the same word, and there it says, And the names of other gods you shall not zecher, nor shall they be heard upon your mouth. Now here it's very clear from the context that Zecher does not mean to remember. It's not telling you don't remember Easter. It's telling you don't mention Easter, which I've just done now for educational purposes. Uh, but it's very clear from the context that it shall not be heard upon your mouth. You must not mention it. Don't even mention those names of the pagan gods. And All right, this is a good place to segue from this because the enemy did something really devious with this, where Yah says, don't even mention the names of other gods when you serve me, right? Keep that in mind. And then through translators of the English, you know, from the Hebrew to the English, translations was made from yod heh vav -Heh to Lord and God. Now that's two words in Hebrew, I guarantee you, you don't know. Gimel Dalad, God, it's pronounced God, but we see it in the in, in the English phonetic spelling of one of the Hebrew tribes called, and you may say it as Gad, G-A-D, but it's not pronounced as Gad. It's pronounced God, okay? Now, if you go and look at Strong's 1408 and 1409, those two letters, Gimel and Dalid, is pronounced God. In ancient times, this was a deity of money and of fortune, okay? That's why Leah said, how fortunate when she named her son God. She said, how fortunate. That's what the name means in Hebrew. But then we get this phonetic word God, G-O-D, that we, re re we replace Yah's name with. So we're, we are literally speaking a Hebrew word. Remember what he just said, don't even let it come out of your mouth. But the English translators, the enemy working through them, actually put in a very offensive word in Yah's word, God. And I'll prove this to you. If you take out a $1 bill out of your purse or your wallet, and you flip it over and look at the back. It says, in God, we trust. And then it's got an all seeing eye over a pyramid and all that kind of stuff. I would submit to you, that's not yod heh The fact that it's on money, God means the deity of money. The fact that that word is on there, in God we trust. Basically, Americans say, in money we trust. Is what that means. And I, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the Torah tells us, he tells us explicitly, don't say these words out of your mouth. And, and what do we have? We have the enemy coming in with translators and giving it to this. Now hear this. Ignorance is a factor here. 
you're innocent when, when there's ignorance, ignorance, but when you know the truth, you're held accountable for that, right? That's in Leviticus. So we've been tricked. The same thing happened with, with Lord. Okay, in Hebrew, that's Baal. I know he says Adonai, but Adonai is better translated as master, not Lord. In Hebrew, it's Baal. Okay, so so the one with the Hebrew math, Matthew, his name is Baal Shem Tov. You know what it actually, his name actually means? The Lord of the good name. Baal Shem Tov, the Lord of the good name. Baal means Lord. It does not mean Adonai. Adonai is master. It, it means something else. It's, it's, so even the word we were given to in English, Lord, or Baal, is offensive to Yah. He says it in Jeremiah. You changed my name to Baal. Who's he talking to? I think he, the, the prophecy is talking about the translators that would come later and change the name. So if the plain text says there's power in his name, call upon his name, we exalt his name, what do you think the enemy is going to do when he sees that in the plain text? Not even talking about the encoded text. We're talking about the plain text, what, what he has heard people recite out of their mouth. We got to do something about the name. And that's why the name was changed 500 years ago and not 2,000 years ago. You understand? So th th this is like a lot of information here. And some things he's just kind of glazing over. But in that point right there where he's talking about, we're not supposed to say these words out of our, this is what we've been given instead of the name. How diabolical is that, folks? And we wonder why Yeshua says in Matthew 7 what he does. And when we're talking about the God of Israel, what it's saying is, this is my name forever. This is my zecher, my mention from generation to generation. What that means is, whenever we summon up his name, whether in our minds or in our mouths, whenever we refer to him, we must refer to him by his name, which is Yehovah, or others pronounce Yahweh. But it's very clear that his name is not Lord. That's just a title. Now, once I realized this, everything started to fall into place. Verses that I'd read 50 times, and I, I went over them before, and I, I never realized the significance of them. And that from these verses, it's very clear that the name of the Creator is not ineffable. For example, Deuteronomy 6.13 says, You shall fear Jehovah your, your God, and you shall worship Him, and in His name shall you swear. And others translate, in His name shall you make oaths. Now, I realized, after I realized that the name of the Creator is not ineffable, I realized, okay, how can you swear in His name if you're not allowed to pronounce His name? It's very clear from this verse that the name is not ineffable. It's not for, forbidden to pronounce the name of the Creator. In fact, that's how we're supposed to mention Him. We're supposed to refer to Him. Again, a second time, it says, Deuteronomy 10.20, Yehovah your God, you shall fear, and Him you shall worship, and to Him shall you cling, and in His name shall you swear. Now, the practice of swearing in the name of the Creator, in the name of Yehovah, is something we see throughout the Tanakh. For example... <clears throat> For example, in 1 Kings 2.23, we see that King Solomon makes a vow and he says, So shall Yehovah do to me and even more. Now what does he mean by that? So shall Yehovah do to me and even more? First of all, by invoking the name of the Creator, he's swearing in the name, just like it says in Deuteronomy. So shall Yehovah do to me and even more. And what he means by that is he's laying a curse upon himself, saying that if I'm lying, may Yehovah do to me X, Y, Z. It doesn't even tell us what the X, Y, Z is. That's not the point of the story. So shall Yehovah do to me and even more than that, and even worse than that. <clears throat> Another vow formula we see throughout the Tanakh is what, uh, the vow that King David uses in 1 Samuel 20, verse 3. And there King David says, As Yehovah lives. He's making a vow in the name of the Creator, Yehovah, saying, As Yehovah lives. And what he means by this vow is, If I'm lying by my very actions, I'm denying the life of the Creator. That's a very serious vow. And, on the, and the opposite is also true. If I'm telling the truth by my very actions, I'm declaring, uh, declaring the, life, the life of the Creator. Now, this vow formula, as Yehovah lives, is actually related to a very important end times prophecy, which appears in Jeremiah 12, 16. And this verse was always fascinating to me, this whole passage, because if you read the passage, this is one of the few verses in the entire Tanakh, in the entire Old Testament, which is explicitly and exclusively speaking to the Gentiles. This is a verse that has absolutely nothing to do with me. This is a promise to the Gentiles for the end time. And there it says, And it shall be if they nevertheless learn the way of my people, to swear in my name as Yehovah lives, if the Gentiles will learn to swear as Yehovah lives, in the way they taught my people to swear by Baal, 
meaning the Gentiles used to swear as Baal lives, and they came and they taught that practice to Israel. If those same nations will learn to swear as Yehovah lives, then they shall be built into my people. That's a very important end time prophecy for the nations, that they'll be built into Israel if they'll learn to swear as Yehovah lives. Now, you should be getting a little bit nervous here right now, <laughs> because Jesus has forbidden you to swear under any circumstances, and if you swear, you're from the evil one, according to the Greek Jesus. But let's see what it says in the Hebrew. In Hebrew Matthew 5, we read, You have further heard what was said by the ancients, You shall not swear falsely by my name. That's a direct quote, word for word, from Leviticus 19.12. But you must pay your vow to Jehovah, which is a paraphrase of Deuteronomy 23.21. And then he goes on and he says, But I say that you must not swear by anything falsely. Falsely is what he says in the Hebrew. So in the Hebrew, he's not prohibiting vows. He's prohibiting false vows. Not by the earth, which is his footstool. Meaning, you must not say, I swear by the earth and be lying. You have to be telling the truth if you swear by the earth. Nor by Jerusalem, which is his footstool. Nor by your head, because you cannot make one here white or black. But your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything added to this is evil. And we'll get back to anything added to this is evil in a minute. But in verse 37, he starts off saying, Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Now, he's not talking about making vows here. He's talking about making false vows. So when he says, let your yes be yes, what he means is, in this new context, is if you say, I swear by Jerusalem, yes, I will do such and such, that better be a true yes. That better not be a false yes. And if you say, no, I swear by the throne of God, I will do such and such, that better be a no. You better not, you better not be lying there. Now, why would he need to tell us that not to make false vows? Or why would he need to tell you not to make false vows? Isn't it obvious not that you shouldn't make false vows? That, that, that's pretty obvious. But what happened apparently is in that period, some Pharisees came along and they said, well, they said, okay, it says in Leviticus 19.12, you should not swear falsely by my name. So if I don't use the name, I'm allowed to swear falsely. That's what the Pharisees were teaching in this period that you're allowed to swear falsely as long as you don't use the name. Because it says, by my name. And anyway, they don't use the name, so they, have no, they can swear falsely all day long. Now, what Yeshua is saying is, no, when it says in Scripture not to swear falsely by my name, it doesn't mean you can swear falsely by other things. Yes, as a, a keeper of Torah, you're supposed to be swearing by the name of the Creator. That's what we read in Deuteronomy. But if you're going to swear by other things, that doesn't mean you're allowed to lie. The principle behind this commandment is not to swear falsely. Even if you don't use the name, you're not supposed to swear falsely. And, and I think that's obvious to anybody who uses common sense and looks at this in its context. That this is not a permission to vow falsely or to make false, to swear falsely. Simply, the way that an Israelite should be swearing is by the name. And if you're swearing by the name, you must not swear falsely. And all Yeshua is doing here, he's, he's bringing out the underlying Torah principle, saying, no, what you Pharisees are doing, opening up these loopholes, saying, I'm allowed to swear falsely, that's not the point of the commandment. You're, you're over-literalizing it, you're taking the words and disembodying them from the context and from the, the meaning behind what it's saying. You're only taking the words and not the spirit of what it's really saying, which is the contextual uh, meaning that anyone with common sense would understand. Now, there's no doubt that 2,000 years ago when Yeshua said this, he would have been accused by the Pharisees of adding to the Torah. Because they said, it does say, by my name. And if you tell me I can't swear falsely by Jerusalem, where does it say that in Scripture? Now, to anyone who, has who uses their common sense, to the simple Israelite shepherd or farmer who comes and hears, you shall not swear falsely by my name, it's obvious that you can't swear falsely by other things as well. That's obvious. But to the Pharisees, that's not so obvious because to them, Scripture is a divine code. And... Yeshua wanted to make it very clear that he's not adding to Torah. He's just bringing out the underlying Torah principle. And that's why he ends his statement saying anything added to this is evil. He wouldn't add anything to the Torah because that would be evil. And this is simply a paraphrase of Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2. Do not add anything to the Torah or take away. And Yeshua is simply reiterating this uh, basic Torah principle. Now what we have in the Greek Matthew, like it or not, is an abolition of vows. Jesus is coming along and abolishing vows. You're forbidden to swear by anything. That's, that's, a, that's a fact. That's what he says there. In the Hebrew Matthew, on the other hand, we have an abolition of false vows. That's a very different message, isn't it? A very different statement. He's not abolishing vows. He's abolishing false vows. And really what we see is the Greek Jesus, as he's called in the Greek, the Greek Jesus is abolishing entire Torah commandments. Don't worry about adding to the Torah. Obey whatever the Pharisees tell you to do. And don't worry about making... Uh, 
don't, don't worry about vowing in the name of the Creator. Don't vow at all. That's what I'm telling you to do. Don't swear at all. Whereas we've now uncovered uh, Hebrew Yeshua, the words of Yeshua as he's portrayed in the Hebrew, and there he's upholding Torah. He's saying they're claimed to authority. They sit in the seat of Moses. Do as Moses says. Do as he says. Uh, and they're telling you that you can jump through these loopholes and swear falsely. No, that's not the point of the commandment. The point of the commandment is not to, is not to swear falsely at all. Not to, not to swear falsely. Now, you as believers may to, need to make a real decision. A real, you have to ask yourself a question. The Greek Jesus is changing the Torah, adding, taking away, abolishing, modifying. The Hebrew Yeshua is upholding the Torah. You need to make the decision and ask yourself the question, who are you going to believe? You can't just ignore the Greek and you can't just ignore the Hebrew. They're both there. You need to make the real dis conscious decision, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the Greek Jesus that's changing Torah or the Hebrew Yeshua who's upholding Torah? And by the way, I don't want anyone to walk away from here tonight and says, Nehemiah claims that there were two people who walked the earth and taught 2,000 years ago, one named Jesus, the other named Yeshua. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the way his words are portrayed in the Greek is fundamentally different than how the words are portrayed in the Hebrew. And you need to, you need to decide which one, of those, which one of those statements you believe what's portrayed in the Greek or what's portrayed in the Hebrew. Let, let me help you out with that decision there. And, and uh, let's really look at the whole point of this, uh, and he doesn't get into it, but I've, I've seen one other teacher um, tap into this, and I've kind of seen the same thing with something that Paul says in 2 Thessalonians about the lawless one who comes, who, who rises up, right? I'm not going to get into it because it might offend some of you, um, but I think even in that time, even in the time of Yeshua, in the time of Paul, <clears throat> they understood that Yeshua would be recreated into another image, right? And the Catholic Church, in there's no question, they absolutely did this. This is how we get the, the, the Catholic Jesus and the Hebrew historical man called Yeshua. They're two different ones. But we're supposed to believe they're, they're one and they hide the original in you know behind the the fake so you can't see them right they reinvent them they write rewrite history is essentially what they've done right and in doing that and in and and the fact that you know there are translations from the original language and i believe that was aramaic to you know greek to whatever there are things that are lost in that process and things that are rewritten. And even in the King James today, they have what's called the revised edition. And that happens every year. They revise it. And in, in other words, they rewrite it. They make it easier to, for people to understand. <clears throat> and they change things. Okay? So we've got a problem because what emerges from that is false doctrine and false beliefs and, and things like that. And it causes a problem. Look at Hebrew Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 and on. And there Yeshua is speaking to the Pharisees throughout Matthew 23. And there he says to the Pharisees, Woe to you, you blind chairs. You can look in your Greek and you'll see it says, Woe to you, you blind guides. In the Hebrew, he says, You blind chairs. Remember Matthew 23, verse 2, he said they sit in the seat of Moses. And now he's calling them the blind chairs. Yeah, you're sitting in that seat, but you're blind chairs. Woe to you, you blind chairs who say that he who swears by the sanctuary is not obligated. Does that sound familiar? Swear by the sanctuary is not obligated. In other words, if you say, I swear by the temple in Jerusalem, you're allowed to lie because you haven't used the name. Who say that he who swears by the sanctuary is not obligated, but he who vows by anything is sanctified to the sanctuary building is obligated to pay. Meaning if you make a vow to bring something to the temple, then you have to pay it. Well, that's very convenient, isn't it? Uh, Madmen and blind men, which is greater the sanctuary or the thing which is sanctified to the sanctuary? And you say he who vows by the altar is not obligated. But he who vows to bring a sacrifice must give it. Meaning if, if you say, I swear by the altar in Jerusalem, then you're allowed to lie because you haven't used the name. But if you swear to bring a sheep to the altar, then you have to give it because some of the priests were Pharisees and the Pharisees have got to eat. So it's a simple economic consideration. Which is greater, the sacrifice of the altar, the sanctuary of the sacrifice? And this next verse, verse 20, is really, I think, the decisive verse. There he says, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all that is in it. So here he's actually upholding vows. Now what happened to if you make a vow by anything, you're from the evil one? That's not here at all. That's not reflected at all. He's saying if you make a vow, you must keep that vow. You must not swear falsely. Now the reason this is so significant is because in the Greek, in the uh, very same verse in Greek Matthew, 
he says, Therefore he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. In other words, in the Greek, he's saying the exact same thing as he's saying in the Hebrew on this particular verse, upholding vows. Meaning that in Matthew 23, 16 to 20, both in the Greek and the Hebrew, Yeshua is saying no to false vows, yes to true vows. Well, what happened to anybody who swears is from Satan? That's not being reflected here even in the Greek. So let's, let's summarize what we have here. Against vows, we have Greek Matthew 5, and by the way, Greek James 5, 12, which is a paraphrase of Greek Matthew 5. In favor of vows, we have the Torah. Uh, that's a pretty si significant one. We have Jeremiah 12, 16, Hebrew Matthew 5, Hebrew Matthew 23, and then even Greek Matthew 23. So what you can see is the Hebrew, uh, or the, the Greek, is, the Hebrew is consistent with itself and it's consistent with the Torah. He's uh, against false vows, in favor of true vows, whereas the Greek is not even consistent with its, itself. In Matthew 5, he's against vows altogether. In Matthew 23, he's upholding vows. So the Greek is not even internally consistent. And okay. you need to make the decision. Here's where the bipolar stuff comes in. Because the same thing happens with Paul. And you got, it, you know, in this one language in the Greek, where it's not distinguishable. So it looks like there's a conundrum there. Is everybody following? How there, there's things that are lost in these translations. And if we don't understand the original and, and what the context is, we can get way off into something that's that's not even there. We're reading into it, right? That's what he's telling us here. Who are you going to believe? The Hebrew Yeshua, how Yeshua's words are portrayed in the Hebrew, or the Greek Jesus, the way he's portrayed in the Greek? Now, everything I talked about up till now is is described in much greater detail in my book, The Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. Now you understand the title, that the way his, portrayed is, uh, his words are portrayed in the Hebrew is different than how they're portrayed in the Greek. And now I want to talk about a few things which are not discussed in my book, but they're going to be discussed in my next book, which I'm writing right now. And the first thing I want to talk about are the manuscripts of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. And one of the things that we find is that Hebrew Matthew was published in 1987 along with an English translation. And when it was published, it was published along, uh, based on nine manuscripts. And of those nine manuscripts, you find that over time, the manuscripts go through a process called assimilation. Assimilation to the Greek. And what that means is that they start out very different from the Greek. And over time, a Hebrew scribe comes along and says, wait a minute, that's not what it's supposed to say in the Hebrew. That's not what it's supposed to say in Matthew. And why does he say that? Because he's read the Greek. And what he ends up doing is changing the Hebrew to match the Greek. So for example, in Hebrew Matthew 5.34, we saw the sentence that makes sense that Yeshua's original words were, I say to you that you must not swear by anything falsely. Well, some Hebrew scribes came along, and in some manuscripts, when they were copying them, they said, wait a minute, I know it doesn't say falsely in the Greek. And what they did is they deleted this word. And you end up with the Greek reading in the Hebrew, I say to you that you must not swear by anything, which doesn't make sense. Now, the reason this is important is that of the nine manuscripts that were published, Two of these are very close to the Hebrew original words of Yeshua, meaning that when you compare them systematically with the Greek, you find many differences, and when the Greek doesn't make sense, the Hebrew does. Whereas the other, the other manuscripts that were published have been highly assimilated to the Greek, meaning that in many places, not consistently, but in many places where the original Hebrew words make perfect sense and differ from the Greek, in these seven other manuscripts, they've been adapted and modified, assimilated to match the Greek. And really of these nine manuscripts, these two, the one in the British Library and the other with one which is de designated Manuscript C, are really the two most important manuscripts. And all these nuggets of truth and information that we're finding consistently appear in these manuscripts. And the other manuscripts, they appear haphazardly. Sometimes it's been modified, sometimes it hasn't. And what that means is out of the nine manuscripts, two are really the most important. Why is that important? Because there's more than nine manuscripts. From my uh, preliminary research, I've been able to find that there are at least 23 manuscripts of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. And these are actually specific designations of manuscripts from around the world. For example, you can go to London to the Montefiore Library and ask to see manuscript number 286. And that's a manuscript of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. And these other 14 manuscripts have never been published. Now, if the first nine manuscripts, if two out of those, contain all these nuggets of truth and information, who knows what's in these other 14 manuscripts? No one knows. They haven't been studied. And until they're actually published, we won't know what uh, information will come out of these manuscripts. The next thing I want to talk about is the question of the age of a manuscript versus, versus the age of composition. That's a very important topic that we have to understand. This is a basic concept in textual studies, that the age that something was copied, the date that a manuscript was copied, very often differs from the date that it was originally written. 
For example, if you open up to uh, the World Almanac and Book of Facts from 2005, that book was printed in 2005. However, if you turn to the Declaration of Independence, uh, that was copied and printed in 2005, but it was originally written in what year? In 1776. So although the age of the, of the manuscript, or in this case the printing, is 2005, the original date of composition is 1776. Why is that important? Because Shem Tov Ibn Shaprut copied Hebrew Matthew in 1380. That doesn't mean that he wrote Hebrew Matthew or composed Hebrew Matthew in 1380. Now, let's look at some other examples of this. Josephus Flavius was, is a famous Jewish historian who lived in the first century. And he wrote a history of the Jews called Antiquities of the Jews. And that was written in the first century. However, our earliest complete manuscript, our earliest manuscript of uh, Antiquities of the Jews, is only from the 10th century. 900 years after he wrote his original book. Now, the original book written in the hand of Josephus, that's been gone for more than a thousand years. And the reason for that is that, do, that manuscripts very often will not last more than a few hundred years. And if they're not copied, and copies made of those copies, and copies made of those copies, then the book won't survive. And in this case, the earliest manuscript of uh, Antiquities of the Jews is from the 10th century. Even though no one in the world denies that this book was written in the first century. Here's another interesting example. The earliest complete manuscript of Isaiah is from the first century before the Common Era, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, Isaiah wrote his book and prophesied 700 years earlier. The original book written by Isaiah, that's long gone. That's been gone for more than 2,000 years. Our earliest complete copy is from only 700 years after Isaiah wrote his book. And the significance of this is that although Shem Tov Ibn Shaprut copied Hebrew Matthew in 1380, the linguistic and textual evidence prove that it's much earlier than 1380. And in many cases more original than the Greek version. The last thing I want to talk about is the question of Hebrew versus Aramaic. And this is something that's gotten a lot of attention recently. The Aramaic question. How many people here have seen the movie The Passion of the Christ? Okay, a good number of people. In the movie The Passion of the Christ, what language did Jesus of Nazareth speak? A right, he, wrote, he spoke Aramaic. Okay, so, well... I think we should stop the discussion here because it wouldn't be right for me to uh, argue with such a great Hebrew scholar as Mel Gibson. But No, but seriously, Mel Gibson went and he talked to, I'm sure, experts who told him that in the first century Yeshua spoke Aramaic. And why is it that he thought that? Or why is it that his experts thought that? And here's one verse that has a lot of people uh, very much confused. Acts 26, 13 to 14. This is a famous vision that Shaul has, that Paul has on the road from Damascus. And there Paul describes his vision. He says, About noon as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Shaul, Shaul, why do you persecute me? And Paul, Shaul, describes that he, he says that he asked who's speaking, and he explains that the answer was that Yeshua is speaking. So according to the, and by the way, this is the NIV translation, uh, which I'm sure you all know it stands for the nearly inspired version. Now, according to the NIV translation, what language did Yeshua speak to Shaul in? According to the NIV, he sp Yeshua spoke to Shaul in Aramaic. Well, let's get to the bottom of this, because if you look at other translations, you, you'll, you probably already know that they don't have the word Aramaic. They have a different word. So why is it that the NIV translates, I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic. I mentioned earlier that based on internal linguistic evidence, it appears that Acts was originally written in Hebrew. However, we have not yet uncovered the Hebrew original of Acts. All we have is the Greek translation of Acts. So let's look in the Greek translation and see in the Greek translation what is the word that is translated into English by the NIV as Aramaic. The word in Greek that's translated as Aramaic is the Greek word Hebraidi. Hebraidi. Do we have any Greek scholars in the audience that can tell me the meaning of this? Any three-year-olds that can tell me the meaning of this word Hebraidi? Hebraidi is Hebrew! That's obvious. You don't need to be a Greek scholar to know that Hebrew idiot is Hebrew. So you, Shaul didn't hear Yeshua speaking to him in Aramaic. He heard Yeshua speaking to him in Hebrew. So what language did Yeshua speak? Hebrew. Okay. So what we can see here is that there's been an intentional modification and change by some of the translation to cover up the fact that Yeshua spoke Hebrew. Now, here's another verse that has a lot of people confused. Psalm 22 and there we read the, the statement, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And where is that familiar from? Of course, everyone knows that's Yeshua's dying words. 
Yeshua is dying. Where's my God? My God, why have you forsaken me? And let's look at how these appear in the Greek. In Matthew 27, verse 46, we read, Yeshua cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, from the words that is to say, you already know that the Greek is translating something from a foreign language. And in fact, the words, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, those four words are not Greek words. Those are foreign words that are quoted in the Greek. And in fact, those words are Aramaic. So if we looked at this verse, it sounds like, if we looked at it in the Greek, it sounds like Yeshua must have spoken Aramaic. His dying words were in Aramaic. Let's look at the Hebrew, though. We've already seen the Greek doesn't always match the Hebrew. In Hebrew, Matthew 27, 46, it says, Yeshua cried with a loud voice, saying in the holy language, Eli, Eli, lama azavtani. Now, Eli, Eli, lama azavtani, that's Hebrew. So in Hebrew, Matthew... His words are quoted in Hebrew, and not only are they quoted in Hebrew, but his words are specifically identified as being spoken in the holy language. Now, throughout history, er, uh, throughout history, Hebrew has been known primarily by two names, Ivrit, which is just the Hebrew word for Hebrew, and the holy tongue, Lashon HaKodesh, the holy language of the holy tongue. So, according to Hebrew Matthew, Yeshua spoke his final words in Hebrew, and not only that, but it's specifically identified as the language he's speaking in, in Hebrew, just like in Acts, it says Yeshua cried out, speaking in Hebrew. Well, what's going on here? And really, we can't go into the, the, the final, we can't get to the bottom of this topic today. We're just going to present the tip of the iceberg. And really, when, when we look at this and this, we follow this to its logical conclusion, we get an entire new understanding of that final scene as Yeshua is dying of what happened there. But we'll look at all right, all right, you guys. We're going to stop it right here. He goes into a completely uh, new teaching from that point, and uh, that that concludes the um, Greek Jesus with the Hebrew Yeshua. So I hope you learned something from that. You can see that we are talking about two different ones, and even Paul mentions this in Second Thessalonians that the the uh, you know the lawless one that that will arise. In in my opinion, in a, in a opinion of another teacher that I've seen. This could be the Roman Jesus Christ that rises up and kind of takes the place of the original, right? Anyway, uh, great teaching. I hope you guys learned something from that basic foundational stuff that we got to we got to get under our belt, you guys, um, in in understanding who Yeshua is, uh, who he was, and and who he who continues to be, right? Uh, because uh, the church has done a lot of damage with interpretation of man-made traditions and things how things evolved to get to where we we are today and it's a mess it's a complete mess right so thankful we've got to i see paul you're with us today brother you, you made it in i tried to get us out and um get that over before an hour but i commented <laughs> several places we're still Thank about you. an hour and 15 minutes i think we still have time to for you to share codes brother if you want okay to you like to usually finish around what? Well, I don't like, you know, when I kept the guys for uh, two hours um, that time, I had some people messaging me going, you know, it's it's late on the East Coast. I got to go to bed. Right. So, right. Uh, I didn't, I didn't want to. Um, yeah, it's only 6.15 here on the West Coast, but yeah, 9.15 back there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You should be well, able to share, brother. Okay. So let me start with something lighthearted just as a segue. Um, this is what I showed you last week, um, my anointing code. I mentioned, I wanted to show you that there is a little pictograph here with Israel making a tent right over my name, right there. So I like pictographs. So, and then another lighthearted pictograph here. Um, it's the same table that I've been showing the last couple of weeks. My name here. And um, Kuf, Noon, Dalid, Yod, that's codes. And then Given, Israel. And it makes the shape of a het which means life. So I've got a crown of life right on my head. So if you like pictographs, that one's pretty cool too. Okay. Now, 
to our main feature for the day. Something pretty serious. I don't know how much Seventh-day Adventist knowledge you all have, but um, one of the main foundations of the whole church is the Saturday Sabbath. And uh, 150 years ago, we had this prophetess named Ellen White, and uh, they studied the Bible really hard. And um, she had also visitations from angels, and basically, they believe in the Saturday Sabbath. Um, they thought that that was correct because they saw Israel doing the same thing. And um, I was going to start here and go around the table this way, but I decided this morning to start with the punchline right, right here. Um, there's Israel and Israel right here like bookends on Aleph, Lamed, Noon, that's Ellen, and then White, Lamed, um, I'm sorry, Vav, Vav, Yod, Yod, Tet, so Ellen White crossing right there, and this is the Y, the Y, and Sabbath, Sabbath. This is Israel and SDA. So that's it's kind of undeniable right there. Even 666 connecting with Ellen White. Um, I have been a, an Adventist for over 50 years, so it does me no pleasure to present this to you. But in the name of truth, I got to present what the codes are saying. And that's pretty pretty definitive right there um so that's the meat and potatoes of of this table right here once again it's the same table i've been showing with my name here and then we've got babylon deception and sabbath commandment we have fourth commandment we have commandment prophecy israel here commandment prophecy given uh, prophetess here in black prophetess as in a female prophet as in ellen white um there is an anomaly here that really caught my eye. Shaker. It's it's uh, false. Shaker, yeah. And false. Yeah, um, so you got two witnesses right there on the prophet, right? So exactly. And false yeah. witness. Yeah. And um it looked like there was there was something the father was trying to grab my attention with this so i looked at it and asked the spirit is there something more here and it's actually shin resh shin resh that means minister minister false minister false minister and she had an angel ministering to her angel right here deception right there and deception again running through a second time going the, the whole diagonal of the whole table um so deception and then belief and the hebrew word for belief here is um religion or faith imuna it's imuna alaf mem vav nun he imuna it means faith or belief yeah great Great. Yep. All right. And then we have the lie again going through here, right there. And it goes through of Israel. So the lie of Israel, 
but the Adventists followed, <laughs> thanks to the angel also. Um, oh yeah, angels right here in the purple. Also Israel, okay. And then Mem is the word from, from Babylon. And we could even do without is this word right here in orange. Um, yod hey bob hey um, I'm getting my <laughs> all my <laughs> all my sacred names mixed up. <laughs> Yahuwah, basically, right? Yeah, Elohim, right there in the red. Elohim. Okay, Elohim. Elohim. Right under that, so, where well, you got the you got a uh, orange yod. That's yod hey bob hey right there. Yeah. Okay. okay. That, All right. That little negative sign you see there because right. the Jews don't spell the name right. out right. in this code program. They use symbols. Yeah. And if you look at that, there's a negative there. That's the hey. And if you go one line up and you see the asterisk in the yeah. in Elohim, that's the another another attempt of not spelling out any one of Yah's names. They'll use a symbol. Yeah. So that's Elohim. Mm -hmm. And then you'll mm -hmm. see one for Adonai. Um. Uh. Yeah. Which is a pound sign, a pound right. sign. Yeah. Yeah. I need to make a list of them and just put all their spellings. I'm good with. I like lists. <laughs> Matter of fact, I can show you one. I just saw it right here. Yeah. Let's see if it'll let me um pull pull this up. Right. I, I see one. Where Where did it go? There it is. Right there. You see right here. Adonai, and it's a, it's a hash, right there. That's another attempt of um nice. Yeah. Right. Of um that's cool. You can draw on my table, huh? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Right All right. So um once again, the lie. And this word going across in ELS is maintained. Okay, so the lie maintained. And once again, we have false sharing with the lie. So false and false messenger. Okay. And belief going through that. Um, so the lie comes right down here into this area with angel. And it connects with Samael, which is basically Satan, the angel right there, and running exactly through Samael is the word fourth, as in fourth commandment, right there. So Satan hates the fourth commandment because it's the only one, if you read it in Exodus, it's the only one, I've been taught that the Sabbath commandment is the seal of God because it's um, as opposed to the mark of the beast, like in Revelation, it says you're either going to get the seal of God or the mark of the beast. And the seal of God is is the Sabbath commandment. The Sabbath commandment gives the name Elohim and his dominion, creator of heaven and earth. Sorry for using the word God so much, but... Um, it is the one commandment with his dominion in the commandment. And so Satan has done a special attack on the real Sabbath. So it's running right together. Um, so I have here Sabbath maintained. Oh, I was just talking about the seal of God. And here it is right here. So in the brown, I'm, I forget which way it goes, but it shares right here with knowledge. So seal of, in brown, the living Elohim. So seal of the living Elohim. Um, commandment, and we have codes going through here, Kuf, Vav, Dalit, 
Yod. Given SDA is in that same line. Um, we have without knowledge, knowledge of the truth. Um, here's something super interesting for Jonathan. <laughs> we have Jonathan, and then his last name, right? You share a tet with Ellen White. Well, um, probably not in a bad way, but in a good way, which I'll show you in a moment. Probably because this is the falsehood. Well, and I had then, to, I, you know, I had to study some of Ellen White's teaching because when I first started coming into realizing that Sabbath would actually mattered, I looked at the Seventh Day Adventists and and um, what what the teachings were there, right? And what right. I discovered is she actually got the Sabbath from what Israel was doing exactly at that exactly. time, and not what the biblical Sabbath actually says. Right. Yeah, yeah I think it's amazing how the, the bookends of Israel, right yeah. here. And Ellen she was on the so listen for the time that she was in, and there's no internet, and there's no way for her to quickly, you know, scan through text and and yes. you know, all the things that we have access to. Right? Um, I'm not a genius, you guys. I there, just have access to a computer, <laughs> and I can, there, <laughs> you know, research things. Ellen White had what she had, and right. she believed it. And, and I'm not saying she's a bad person or anything like that, but she was on to something. It's the same thing with the with the people that were saying that, you know, Yah has a name, like the Jehovah, even though they were wrong about the name, there's no J, Ye Jehovah Witnesses, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. But then the Baptists mm -hmm. did the same thing. They picked up on immersion and so on and so on. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, most religions are like 95% right, but I think the Jesuits have, infiltrated they had the uh, truth you know? of their day and that's yeah. what they were working with right and so um yeah. i don't i don't you know for for instance with the rapture thing and darby and all that kind of stuff i had wrestled whether that was inserted maliciously or what was going on there and mm -hmm. what i got from mm -hmm. it was these people weren't trying to deceive they were trying to mm -hmm. give hope to people right and that's right. why these things crept in right they weren't trying to you know insert something new right right in fact, Ellen White said that uh, truth would progress until the very end. So, what do they call that? The, Today's truth or uh, present, present, truth. present day yeah. truths? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, <clears throat> and she she even said that in the very final days, the Sabbath would be proclaimed more fully, and yeah. it was going to make a lot of people angry. But she well, didn't really know figure out because they've been led, you know, wrongly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Right. Right. I think so. So, um, so your name right, right here is crossed by teacher going up in teal here and sharing a rush with teacher <laughs> and then kind of sharing this word here, chosen right here, the truth in purple, the truth. And the truth again, running through Jonathan. And then there's this word in red here, revealed. Moed. Moedim. Moedim again. And then here's Samael watching everything. <laughs> um, he's... It's all about his lies, you know. Um, yeah, he doesn't want, he does. Okay, so there's a couple of points that Yah's revealed to me in the end times he's going to unite his people on, and that's his name and his Shabbat. Yeah. He's going to unite. All those that are going to come out of the yeah. churches and stuff, they're going to see that Yah has, he thinks highly of his name. It's mm -hmm. very important. We can't change right. his name, just, right. just like you saw in Nehemiah's presentation. The English translations did that. Even mm -hmm. gave us something that was, you know, horrendous to the father, which is the, the word God. And, and, and now most Christians call him God, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you right. look at that in Strong's 1408 and 1409, that's clearly a Babylonian deity of fortune. It came from Leah and now we have it in the English text, right? So um, he meets us where we are. 
but right. there comes right. a day where the, the truth is revealed and right. you know right. all the stuff that we were talking that's not going to matter anymore that's right. not even right. going to work anymore mm -hmm. right yeah, yeah people got saved in the name of jesus and and y'all did healings in the name of jesus but i believe there's coming a day where that's not going to happen anymore because mm -hmm. the truth is going to be out and he's not going to honor the the ignorance anymore okay mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. I forgot if I mentioned this, but commandment, knowledge, without yeah, I think you did without codes. Okay, all right. Um, we have lost in the plain text right here. Lost Sabbath and an ELS. That's kind of cool. Uh, we have Sabbath prophecy given and I'll show you what this underlying text is uh, once again I have man things keep getting zoom things get if in my hit, way if you hit your every own time. tile on your uh... well see I can't get to it because there's a zoom I got you. All right. Uh, so thing maybe, covering okay. it. Let me let me see if I can do something about it. Here, did I get that? Okay. All right. All right. Where was I here? So Ezekiel. 34, 16. Are you still there? Yes, I'm actually okay. talking All right. to muted mic. Okay. Yes, we could see. All right. All right, very good. Okay, Ezekiel 34, 16. I will seek that which was lost, the true Sabbath, right. and bring again that which was driven away um, into Babylon, basically. Mm -hmm. Um God basically said, there's a, a verse in Lamentations 2, 6, the Lord hath caused the solemn feasts and Sabbaths to be forgotten in yep. Zion and hath despised in the indignation of his anger, the king and the priest. Yeah. It was defiled so, so much. That's what he prophesied and said he would happen. He said, I'm going to send you into the nations. You're going to forget who you are identity crisis <clears throat> you're going to serve mm -hmm. other gods of wood and stone and and uh, you know things like that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so he laid it out right right you you would forget about the feast right you forget right. about my shabbat yeah so um that's it for this table but there's some more underlying things here that i'm going to show you some subtext <laughs> that okay. i just couldn't squeeze in here okay um Okay. Whoops. Try this again. You're trying to share a different table? I, stop yeah. share and reshare. Okay. Yep. Stop. There you go. Okay. Here it comes. All right. Okay. So they did not see. It's a nice sentence going diagonal. They did not see without codes. Um, Moed. Um, the lie. And this is prior knowledge mm -hmm. allowed in the green Elohim. So Elohim allowed, he allowed, he'll wink at the knowledge they had, basically. He says he'll do that. And until you know the truth, yeah. he'll accept what truth you do have. Right, fact, he'll meet you there. Yeah. 
Yeah, look at this. Lost knowledge. And this is this is Hodesh, like uh new moon basically. Yep. The head the head of the head of the month. That's right. Right. Um and once again maintained, allowed. Elohim. Uh, this is interesting here. Evil in the black. Information. Mm. Now people um, die for a lack of knowledge, right? Yeah, and this is angel again, so you could do evil angel information. <laughs> and this is, once again, the truth and Moed and Moedim. Uh, okay, I think that's all I got for you, Jonathan. Very um, good, brother. Thank you so much. Yeah, good that's, job. Good okay. way to drill down on it, man, and getting thank to you. the thank bottom you. of um, you know what you're searching, what you're searching right. out there. Right. Mm -hmm. That's really cool how you can do that. Um, and and this applies in a lot of things, yeah. you guys. That you know, yeah. uh, doctor. And for it for it to show up my show up in my personal name table, that was pretty special too right <laughs> it's been a part of my life for 50 years so right, right. well you know it's where you're coming from uh, right let's see here where did it go oh there it is all right so i was going to show you this guys um i was talking about strong's 1408 1409 a moment ago are you guys able to see this yeah 1408 God or Gad, right? We were just talking about this, right? Where in, in you know, 6,000, 7,000 times <clears throat> in the Bible. And think about this. If your word tells you that in the end times, Joel prophesies that the people in the end, the Gentiles are going to call upon his name. They're going to call in the time of distress, right? And, and some 400 places in the Bible, it says something about the name. Right now, 500 years ago, the enemy worked through man. And, and remember, the printing press wasn't even around until 500 years ago. And when Bible started being printed and translations, guess what the enemy did? Hey, guess what, guys? It says something about that name. We got to hide that name. We got to do something about that name. Can give them the name. You know what happened on the resurrection, right? You know what happened when uh, David went against Goliath and he said, you know, you come with me in javelins and spears and I come with you with what? He didn't say rocks. He said, I come you against you in the name of yod Hey vav Hey. Didn't say anything about rocks, <laughs> right? That's how he defeated them in the power of that name. We've been given Gimel Dalad. This is what I was telling you about. Gimel Dalad is two letters. Now the phonetic spelling of that is G-A-D. In English, and and at, we know this as one of the tribes, right? Uh, one of the tribes is named Gad, or we were taught Gad. But guess what? It's not called that. Guess what it's called? God. God. It's a it's a Babylonian deity of fortune, right? Babylonian deity of. For, all right, so let's go to fourteen oh nine. It's the same thing. <coughs> God. All right. So uh, she said, how fortunate. So she named this is Leah when Gad was when God was born. She says, how fortunate she declared. How now how does she know that name? Where, where her father sold idols. Remember the story of Laban? Laban was an idol seller. He sold idols. So Leah was very, very acquainted with Babylonian deities, right? And if you had one that was like the, the G money of all of them, right? He was the one that had all, right, doing MTV videos with all the cash and the bling and stuff. That's God. That's who God is. How fortunate. Look at me. I'm all rich. Look how wealthy I am. You know, make it rain, make it rain. That's God. And on the back of your dollar bill is this deity. It's not yod heh vav -Hey, folks. We've been tricked. And God we serve? No, we don't, neither. We don't serve money. That's what it means. God means money. And it's on the back of our dollar bill. 
and that is diabolical. And I'm not this is I'm not making this up. This is this is the truth. Now, when he tells us not to say the name of another deity out of our mouth, and we got it on our dollar bills, and we're saying, you know, in God we trust, and and you know, I pledge allegiance to the flag, one nation under money, right? Remember that, man. I, mean, I, I can remember in when I was in elementary school, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, saying a pledge of allegiance and saying a prayer every day, and we never said the name of the Father. We said God. Now he met us where we were, but there comes a time. This is what the apocalypse means. The word apocalypse is a Greek word means means the unveiling. It means the revealing of, of revealing of what everything hidden. Everything, even the name. He's going to give us the name in the end times because the prophet said in the end times, the nations will cry out and call upon him. And what is he going to do? He's going to save us. Because What does it say in Psalm 91? Because he knows my name. I'm telling you something. This is important. Don't say, well, he knows my heart. Yes, you're right. And the Bible says your heart's wicked beyond all things. That's what it says. So don't say he knows my heart. I'll just call him God or Lord because now you know the truth. His name is Yodhe Vavhe, Yehovah, Yahuwah, Yahweh. I think there's a, I think his name is so dynamic it's pronounced in all those, by the way. There's no, other than Jehovah, where there's no J, there's there's not a wrong pronunciation of Yodhe Vavhe. They're all right, right? Good fortune. That's what she was saying. How fortunate am I? She was saying that to her sister, by the way, Rachel, who was waiting on her, her children. Leia's having baby after baby after baby. And this one comes along and she's rubbing it in their sister's face. And she's like, how fortunate am I? I got another baby and my sister who he loves more than me. She don't have a baby yet. And God's favoring me. Can you imagine these two sisters doing that to their husband or to each other? <laughs> That's what was going. Listen. The life of Jacob was blessed, but it was also the ultimate soap opera. Okay? The ultimate soap opera, because he had to deal with a lot with his sons, with his daughters, with his wives, and with his father-in-law who tricked him. Yah allowed him to abuse him for 14 years, two Shemitah cycles, because he sinned against his brother. Jacob's life was blessed, but he went through some fire, you guys. And you'll see the same thing in your life. You'll be blessed, but at the same time, things will be going on, and you'll be wondering, where's y'all? Where's he at? He's letting you go through something because he's he's threshing you. He's purifying you. He's working with something, right? He hasn't never abandoned you nor me, right? And we're going to make it through this thing of this country, what's going to happen, all right? He's not abandoned us. Um, so don't don't look at that way. I, I, you know, I'm talking with people every day, some people very close to me, and they're upset with some of the things I've been saying about what, what's about to happen, what I see in the codes. Um, but I keep trying to reiterate to them, you got to remember the promises of what, yeah, he's not coming to punish the righteous. He's coming to destroy the wicked, right? He preserves us. We see these things happen. Psalm 91 destruction doesn't come near you, but you see it happen. 10,000 on one side and a thousand on the other. And it does not come near your home. What, what don't we understand about that? Right? So cling to those kind of things, folks. Y'all's not forgotten you. Even your tears. The Bible says he collects all of our tears, right? He knows every hair on our head. He knows when a sparrow falls out of the sky. There's no detail he's missed, Right? So um, don't get discouraged in some of the things we're seeing in the media and some of the things that people were talking about or potentially some of the things that are going to happen or are coming in the world, like with war and stuff. He's going to preserve us through it, okay? You guys got any questions or anything you want to add before we close out tonight? Thank you, Paul, for sharing what you had, brother. I've, I had a few codes, but I, I don't want to keep you guys more than two hours. I'm just going to put that on YouTube for you guys to see there. I wanted to mention that um, I assumed the class knew what Moed and Moedim was. I think we talked about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just it's it's sure. one of our um vocabulary words. If you guys okay. didn't know, okay. Moed means appointed. 
right? And I think that's one of the very first ones that we, I could be wrong. I could have missed that, but I'm pretty sure that's one of our vocabulary words. Yeah. And um, it's it's interesting that that word, we got, we have to understand what that word means because um, there's things that are lost in translation with English and we get, you know, somehow we got Christians that think the Sabbath is on Sunday and Jews and Messianics that think their Shabbat is on Saturday, right? Guys, the Bible tells us when the Shabbat is. We don't even need codes for this. It's a very simple teaching. And one day we'll get to that. Yah starts teaching us this right at the Passover time, the very first Passover, when they leave Egypt and they get into what's called a lean, uh, where, the, where the 12 wells are over there. Yah says to Moses, I'm going to test the people. I'm going to give them the work week and I'm going to give them my Shabbat and I'm going to see what they do with it. Right? And then we see that exactly one month after they left Egypt, Yah got them on the cycle. He synced them to his calendar. And by the way, that calendar is tied to the moon. They left on a full moon. They got to a leam on a full moon. The next day was a Shabbat. And after that, you know, when they got to a leam, that, that was a Shabbat. The next day was the first day of the work week, which was day 16, right? And they worked for six days collecting Every day and twice as much on the sixth day and then rested on the seventh. He lays out the pattern right there. Right there. It's it so the Bible tells us that the, the Shabbat is connected to the moon, first of all. It's in sync with that, but also that it's the eighth, fifteenth, twenty-second, and twenty-ninth of every month. That's the pattern he's established in Exodus 16. You guys, it's mathematically impossible to be anything else. He tells you the numbers. And incidentally, when the when the Shabbat is mentioned in other places in the Bible, it's always like a, the 15th or the 8th or something like that. The Shabbat, not a feast day, uh, you know, because you have like Yom Kippur appears on like the 10th day, right? Talking about Shabbats and high Shabbats, like Passover is going to be, you know, right at the, the, the 14th day. And then the next day is a, is a Shabbat. So they got 14th and the 15th right there, right? Even with in um, the book of Esther, when we are given Purim, right? That's established. That three-day holiday is established two days before of a Shabbat. So you basically got a three-day Shabbat in Purim. That's the 13th, 14th, and 15th of every Adar. Every Adar, every month, Purim is the 13th, 14th, and 15th. If you read in the text in Esther, the 15th was always a Shabbat. Yah added two more days to it to commemorate Purim. That's another, that's another witness right there. The only way you can have Shabbats fall on the 15th and on the 8th, and, and, it, and this is every month, is a lunar solar calendar. It does not happen with an every Saturday is the Shabbat, you guys. It doesn't. It doesn't even line up. Maybe once, one month a year that it lines up to 8, 15, 22, 29, but not every month. The Bible says it's every month. How do we get to, How do we get from there to every Saturday? But in Christians, it's every Sunday. Man-made tradition. We're going to talk about that coming up soon, you guys. It's one of the most important teachings, and I'd been depriving you guys of that in this class, and uh, y'all got on me about that. It's important, and I'm going to show you how the Bible tells us when the Shabbat is, but then we also have codes that confirm it as a witness. All right. So, yeah, it is confusing about the seasons, um, but I, th I think, okay, so so confusing is a very interesting, that word is Babel, the, the, the father of confusion and lies is Satan, he is the one that wants to confuse you, and I'm going to try to eliminate that, we're going to go very slowly and look at the scripture, and you can see mathematically what those days are, right? And see how it lines up with the moon. Psalm 104, 19. The moon determines the, the Moedim, that word, and the sun knows it's going forth. The moon determines Moedim. What's Moedim? Shabbats, pointed times, new moons, feast days. Those are all Moedims. The moon determines the Moedim. says it right there in the word, you guys. Most don't want to hear that, but we're going to get into that. We're going to tackle it, and I'm going to show you how the Bible confirms itself. It, it teaches, it doesn't contradict itself. 
it's going to tell you the information there. And I showed you the guys that last, uh, one of the last videos I did with, um, the name and the oil from the, the 10, uh, virgins, right? How the Bible interprets itself. It gives us the information codes confirm it. Okay. All right. If there's nothing else, you guys, let me pray for you. We will see you. Um, Nana has the table. Who? I did not see any, any, any message. Deanna, Deanna does. Leanne. Leanna does. Leanna, you want to share? It's awfully late now, but yes, I did have one. But if, if you guys are tired, I can do it next time. It's about oh. a It's up to you guys. The last time I kept you up more than two hours, I had people messaging saying it's too late. They were on the East Coast. It's, a, it's 10 o'clock now on the East Coast. So, yeah, most of you guys are so, some of you are on the West Coast. So, um, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do, you want to share it now? We could still, we could do it now. Leanna, you how much? Like tired. Uh, it's the, it's actually, how long do you think it would be? I don't think it'll be very long. It's two, but it's the same subject. It's about Trump. Okay. All right. Share, share what you got. Okay. All right. You should be able to share that the, it's uh, already set up. All right. Um, this is uh, Donald Trump uh, one right here is the Trump. D Trump right up here. Mm -hmm. Over here uh, is election up in this corner. If I can get to it is cancellation going all the way across the table. Um, going down, down to here. Um, we have um, jailed. Um, Fifty-seven twenty-six, which is twenty twenty-six. I did several codes. I got forty-seven of, and they all had the same stuff in them. Uh, it, it's going from 5724, I mean, uh, 2024 to 5786, which is 2026. We've got um, incarcerated, conviction, which we already know he's been convicted, but he has not been. They were waiting for the results. Um, and let's see uh, if there's anything else on this one. Oh, this, this word keeps showing up in everything, Kabbalah or Kabbal. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, and also we have legal warfare. Well, we all know that's going on. And the next code is down here. Um, D Trump again, up the middle. Um, 5784, that's this year, uh, and war, which is real close to this year, so we know we've got war going on. Um, let me see here. We have legal warfare on this one, too, legal warfare. Legal goes down here. Warfare is right here. Um, and right here at the same skip as his name is jailed. Really? Wow. And uh, we've got 5786, which is right crossing this. So I thought that was might be the year that they do this to him. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is these three letters, <laughs> I looked them up just for fun, and going in the same direction as jailed is, and a cell, and a cell. Really? Yes. And, and that was all. I really couldn't find any good verses. This one is in Acts. The other one was in um, ah, uh, Luke and John, I think. But uh, they had fairly good probabilities, and I... 
I just wanted to warn people in case this happens, they won't be shocked. Yeah. You know, um, and I hope it doesn't happen. I voted for for Trump, uh, you know, the first time, the second time, and this time. But um, anyway, so I just wanted to share that. And thank you for letting me share it, guys. Very good. All yeah, right. you know, if uh, if he doesn't if he doesn't make it in this time, you guys, they're not going to stop. I think they're going to try to to um, assure that he doesn't come back and continue with the the court stuff just to try to ruin him. Um, he really doesn't have a way to come back than in four more years because he will be essentially, you know, as old as as Biden, and so uh, they're they're going to try to put caps on age and all that kind of stuff. So. If he doesn't get in this time, I don't see how he could, he could he could even be a contender the next time, right? So this is it. This is it right here. He has got to he's got to get in there this time, and you know you guys have seen what I've put out. The codes indicate that this thing is shenanigans. Judgment's coming. Y'all's allowing this to happen, but we also see that the you know the parallels with eclipses and and you know what happened in Nineveh. Y'all can change his mind. Um, but the probability on that, I see it's a higher probability that we're, we're going under judgment than it is that we're going to get a reprieve. And uh, I, I don't have any joy saying that, you guys, really. Um, and, and really, it doesn't benefit me at all to, to say that. You know, if I wanted to be popular and be getting all kinds of views on my video, I'd be saying the other thing, right? So it's not necessarily pleasant or even something you I, I quite i've even said this to people you know it, it's, it reminds me of uh, you know a police officer having to go to the, a door to some house and knock on the door and tell a family that their child has been killed or something that's nobody wants to do that right that's like the worst so it, it's very much like that to to be showing codes and telling people that, that you know i didn't want to i didn't want to do it you guys but i felt this urge you know urgent unction from the holy spirit to say get ahead of this thing and and you know this is my hand doing this so i also think that y'all is trying to establish the the validity of his word because this this is coming from his word this is not coming out the phone book this is coming out of his word and he's the one that says in his prophets that he knows the end and the beginning and and vice versa and he's the only one that can tell us that beforehand right yeah, that's absolutely right. All right, you guys, um, I'm going to be probably traveling here very soon. I got, uh, you know, one more thing with uh, my lawyer Tuesday, and then I'm going to try to get out of here before the election. So I'm kind of winging it for next class. We'll we'll see how that goes and where where I am. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm shooting that we're going to be having a, a class next Sunday, but in case something happens, right, just kind of leave that that option out that um, something might happen i don't i don't know what that may be but anyway good class you guys thank you for ha sh hanging out and uh sharing today and uh being with us hope you learned something let me pray for you we will see you guys next week all right i'll be who i'm just so thankful father for each and every student that's here and i'm thankful that you sent them this way that i could teach them that i, I could uh, nurture them in your word father and lead them in the way that they should go. Father, I ask that you go with them this week, that you keep them protected, that you inspire them in your word, that you bring them back at the appointed time. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Love you guys. We will see you in the next class. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.